And this one had a lot of like just places. Had a lot of places. I'd, it had a lot of places. I would find myself These are being my like notes for Rebel Rising. <laughs> I would find myself being like the where 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 are we again? We See, were here, now we're yeah. here, I think, right? We mentioned this <laughs> earlier today, but you know, there's a common criticism of people saying, like, Star Wars feels small. We keep going back to the same planets. But as soon as you get to new planets and you're, you're told to keep track of this stuff, you kind of go like, I don't know where I am. Where's Tatooine? It's hard to track random <laughs> s- random planets in space that in a in a space you don't even know. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And sure. I'm like, so where do we go? We're here now, and now we're, there's a space station, and there's these planets, yeah. and there's so. You- well, to start off the review, I will say there's one place that I absolutely knew where we were every time it came up: Imperial Detention Center and Labor <laughs> Camp LEG eight one seven. Liana Halleck. They said that a few times. Possession of unsanctioned weapon. I, every time we would go back to the present. Yeah. Uh, in, as the, you know, we would, it's a cool format. Like, it's Jen Urso as Liana Halleck mm-hmm. from the beginning of Rogue One yep. in prison. And then we would go back to various ages and kind of track her life once her parents and her were separated on La Mu. Yeah. So, I, 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 just every time, like, I, like it's like, I know, next chapter, I would hear Imperial Detention Center. I'm like, ah, I know. <laughs> now, you listen to this one, too, right? I did. This is my first uh, Audible version. Was it different, or how did that? Did that go for you as far as um, usually it, reading it? I, I liked it. Uh, I think that the uh, lady that did the, uh, the audio book uh, audiobook for this was cast because of her amazing Jen Ursa. Mm. Like, she, I just I just believed that was Felicity Jones. Gotcha. When she would speak, right? Yeah. Uh, her narration voice is an uh, uh, American accent, but then she'd have the English accent for Jen, and I just bought it. Uh, not so much for, like, Saul Guerrero. Sure. You know? I understand that. And I think it's because Saul Guerrero's voice and performance has been so loved at Blind Wave that there was a level of separation where I had to go, no, that's not how he would say it. <laughs> you would say no. like this. I think in a few of them, like yeah, it it works really well for High Republic because yes, I don't have characters. any voice in my head for anybody. But well, whenever you had like Brotherhood, yeah, and you had him like okay, he's doing Obi Wan. Uh-huh. Now he's doing Anakin. Now he's doing Mace Windu. It's like man, his Mace Windu sounds weird. Yeah. You know, like stuff like that would happen. But the actual the thing that I really like <clears throat> about High Republic because I actually because I got on Audible right, I got. Yeah. Uh, Rebel Rising, but I also got the last High Republic because it's been so long since I've read it that I kind of wanted to re reread uh, it, experience some before we did the review on that one, and I was able to hear some of the uh, some of the voices that were provided, and it was really cool. Like whenever it's a Kit Fisto species, there was a Jamaican accent. Whenever it's a Duros, kind of sounds like Cad Bane, you know. Yeah. Whenever it was, you know, like. Even some of the characters, like there was a Count of Sereno, and he quite sounded like Dooku, you know? I'm like, oh, okay, I see what you're doing. It was pretty cool. But it was so subtle, and the voice is different, that I thought that was very strong. Yeah. Whereas with this, I, like, you know, some of the male characters, I kind of had to just, like, let it happen and, and not be distracted by it. But, I don't know, two chapters in, I kind of, like, left that behind me. Hmm. So Interesting. It was a hurdle that I had to jump, and only because it was, like, my, my first real book experiencing it like this. Yeah. But I think I preferred it. I got to, I just got shit done. Sure, you I would be do like, oh, stuff. man, I got to read three chapters tonight. I'm like, all right, I'll you go can mow the yard. Do stuff while you do yeah. it, so it's nice. Um, sure. And I rarely have to like go back. Uh, like other than like when my headphone pops out. Sure. Like I, I thought that I was gonna have a problem with it, but I didn't really have that much of a problem. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had a problem. <laughs> 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 he distracted you with your tea. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I like the book itself. I guess if we get into that now. Yeah, um, let's do it. The, uh, I, I enjoyed that this basically – so Rogue One, you start off seeing, like, you have Jen and her family. Mm-hmm. Krennic's coming. All that kind of stuff happens. She goes in the, the cave and down in the – Oh, yeah. What, whatever that – I don't know what to call it, bunker, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then we jump ahead to her being older, being rescued and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, she's eight, then she's 21. Yeah. I, I enjoyed this, like, covers, like – 10 years she's eight she's 14 she's 16 she's 18 <laughs> yeah, yeah like it covers like Saul uh-huh. comes and gets her out of there and like then what did she do and yeah. like this book is what she did mm-hmm. from then until the prison to where she's being rescued and the book really yeah. kind of covers that whole yeah whole it, grouping of things it does and i understand like not everybody listening to this has read the book yet but what we can all what we all love about star wars is star wars has this very central theme of father sons mothers daughters right family sure and we with the Mandalorian and, and and other various media have 
gotten to really have some cool rep- representation of adopted and found family. Mm. Uh, here, your f- pseudo father is Saul Guerrero. Sure. And this is Saul Guerrero, who has lost his sister, mm-hmm. who fought in the Clone Wars. He's lost his planet, right? Yeah. Like, Onderon is not. He tries, but he is not a good dad. Sure. You know? And like, I think he knows <laughs> that. But his main goal is, like, I will protect this girl. Yeah. Like, I like how it talks about, like, there's stuff going on, yeah. and he looks at Jin, and for a second, his eyes soften. Yeah. Like, they bring up those kind of ideas, uh-huh. where it's like, here's this rough-edged warrior guy, yeah. but he looks at this girl, and it softens him just a little bit. And it they, does. they kind of talk about how she can kind of, like, something about her yeah. is a little different than anyone else. You know? you know, in Rogue One, when they finally meet back up, and he's already so far gone that he just sees traitors everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, she has, like, you left me with a knife when I was, what, 15, 16 is what mm-hmm. she said. Um, and uh, you really get the feel by, like you said, like the eyes softening that Saul, not like he does. I think he really did care. He, You know, how can you not care for a young child that you're helping raise because their parents are gone? Sure. I think he sees it as a weakness mm. and resents it a little bit, and it makes the decision to leave her a little easier. And that's not a good thing, but it might make for a, uh, a good captain for a rebel that will do anything to beat the empire, you know? So I, I thought that was really interesting that I didn't really thought about that before. I just thought like, well, maybe something happened, you know, and granted something does happen, but I don't think Saul makes much of an effort to try to get her back and bring her back because no. not only do I think that he sees a weakness in himself because of her, he knows what it takes to be a rebel uh, or at the very least on his caliber. And he doesn't want that to happen to Jen. Sure. So it's like two faced. Like one of it's like a good instinct, and the other one's a bad instinct. And I think they're both present and equal. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. You have it where one, you don't want her to fall in the same kind of no. thing, but two, if that's kind of like his conscience, mm-hmm. like you don't want that around when you have to do the things you, you know, you don't want to do, or yeah. maybe your conscience wouldn't like you doing. It's also, uh, you know, they talk about Saul's like obsession and his mission is what is Galen Urso doing early in this book. Yeah. And uh, later in the book, whenever that comes back to Rogue One, it's Saul's mission fully realized is the line they use. But there might be this other thing, too, where, like, if Saul really wanted information, it might be better if he didn't care about her. Hmm. But because he does, it like it, it, it does this thing in his head where he think you know, he he compares it to Stila, his sister from the yeah. Clone Wars. Right. And what a leader she was. And how he had so much strength because she was there with him. And when he lost that, he loses something in himself. Uh, And I feel like he kind of gains that back and resents it, which is a really cool way to think about why Saul Guerrero might be the way he is in Rogue One. Sure. Yeah. I think it's one thing that this book does really well is it it helps get you into the mindset of Saul Guerrero. Because, like, this is – I think most of the time that you see Saw in this is before we even see him in Rebels, right? Yeah. Like I would say I, so. I, I don't think you would see him after that. So you have you have like, you know, what you see in Clone Wars, mm-hmm. then you have this, then you have what you see in Rebels, and you yeah. have Rogue One. And I feel like this kind of helps for Jin and Saw both fill in that We would have seen him in Bad Batch, I suppose, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we would have had a young man still. So but you just get like a better, I think, understanding of both those characters and mm-hmm. what they're feeling. Yeah. Like I think I, I, I kind of want to watch Ro- – I just watched Rogue One recently with the kids yep. and stuff. But I kind of want to rewatch it after reading this book to see what my feelings of Jin are. Because, like, I didn't have any problems with her in the movie. But after, like, reading this and seeing more of what she went through, the it's things like, she It's like, oh, saw, I didn't realize the... that she might have had the saddest life in all of Star Wars. Sure, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't know that. They refer to, I think – I think it was in the beginning of the book. Whenever like there's like a warden being like, "Prepare for the worst days of your life in this labor camp that mm-hmm. droids could work and do more of, but they keep this labor camp just to be a, a punishment for yeah. people." And uh, her whole thing was like, "Worst day of my life. This. Yeah, all I'm doing is working and I get food. You know, yeah. like it wasn't the worst day of her life. No, of all the other things in this book that it yeah, covers there are specific happens. moments like where I think that oh, it's because sometimes she finds hope." And then it's completely taken away from her. And that's the worst day of her life. Sure. And that happens like six times. Yeah. Like to the point where, you know, oh, man, it was terrible. Like when they would describe her on Wobani yeah. with her various cellmates and she would just see them die from either 
depression or rebellion, you know? Yeah. And everything was just taken from her. There's this moment where she looks up into the sky, and it's very close to what Samwise Gamgee does in, in the third Lord of the Rings movie. He looks up and he says, look, Mr. Frodo, there's something the darkness can't touch. She sees the sky part and sees the stars, and she's thinking about earlier in the book, there's this idea of, like, do you focus when you look into space? which is, you know, out our window right now. Space. Do you focus on the stars or do you focus on the blackness? Mm. And because of her mother and the giving of the crystal, (laughs) she also realized that there's something that's connecting everything, right? The force, and it's out there, and she can have faith in something even if she doesn't understand it. But in that moment when she sees the stars, and I'm thinking, oh, like Samwise, she's like, the force isn't even real. My mother didn't know what she was talking about, and she focuses on the, the blackness, the darkness, right? And she, like her faith breaks mm-hmm. faith that she never even really thought about just yeah. that, that like that childlike belief that there's someone above you that will take care of you is gone. That was a very poignant moment in the book for me. And I feel like she's had, she had at least two or three of like those very significant ones. Yeah. I remember one where she was looking up and looking at the stars and was like, if you look up far enough, you can ignore the horizon yeah. and stuff like that. And then that made me think about her final moments in rogue one. Yeah. Cause I was like, man, in that moment when she's there with, Cassian yeah and like on the horizon is the death that's coming so it's like maybe you should just look up at the stars and ignore the horizon because yeah. that's what's coming for you you know I don't know yeah but I, it I, does do a good job of like I think showing why she is so jaded when we first meet her yes you know it does like the loss of hope that she has like there's so many moments in this book where I was like man she could have a maybe a happy life here you know this is nice and you know yeah. like she with saw or with uh hatter with seemed, Hatter, she had a whole year cool. with uh, what was her name, the Pontas, <clears throat> yeah, Okshai and Hatter, yeah, yeah, like yeah. the the stuff she had with Hatter, I was like, oh man, why can't she just stay here with him or they, you know, whatever happens, and it kept going, and obviously, it I just things I, don't end well for like any of the experiences she has. Something yeah. always happens, you know, whether she, whether she's getting blackmailed into having to keep doing these jobs that are well. You know, the Empire's not going to like me doing these, but no. then the Empire's wanting me to do this. Uh-huh. You know, like she just, what do you do in those situations? Like everyone wanted to either kill her, lock her up, or you do this job for me. Yeah. And it just like everything was always like, all right. It was it was so heartbreaking when like, you know, Saw was family. Like yeah. she lost her family on, on uh, Lamu, right? Yeah. She loses her mother. She sees her mother die. Her father, to, in her point of view, or leaves and just joins the Empire, right? So she loses that family, and then Saw comes, and then she loses that family, and then she finds the Pontas, and she heartbreakingly loses that family. I, it, it's just so I, – I just was so sad for her. And when she finally gets caught, like, <laughs> she has this mentality of, like, I don't – I hate the Empire. I hate the Rebels. I hate both of them equally. And – the Empire would be fine if it was just the Empire. The Rebels would be fine if it was just them. But when they're together, people die, you know? And she's like, what's the point? And she, like, loses faith in everything. But when she finally gets caught and the Empire is going to take her to, you know, to prison, she has a great line that says, if I was going to go out like this anyway, it should have been for more than nothing. Yeah, it should have meant something. Yeah, yeah it exactly. should have meant something. And, like, that is really cool. And I think we're going to see that in Andor, right? Because... You know, again, we have the the spoiler, you know, if you haven't watched Andor, but there's a really cool, interesting character there called Luthan, and he has that line, like, what do you want to do to, you know, like, come with me, and we can fight these bastards for real, yeah, <laughs> you know? Fight for real. Like, I, that was really cool, and I want to see that develop, but I wonder if that regret <laughs> of losing hope, because it's not like, you know, Cassian, I think, has, he, he believes in the Empire, I'm sorry, he believes in the Rebellion, but he doesn't have much hope until the events of Rogue One, right? Mm-hmm. So I can't wait to see that explored here because it was very effective to me in this book. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think so too. Um, well, that's Jin. <laughs> there's sure, a, that's Jin. There's a, there's a lot of really uh, interesting stuff with Jin, but there's some yeah. really cool characters in here too. Sure. Um, I mean, I really like what they do a lot with uh, – we, we talk about Saw some, and Saw was so connected with Jin. But Saw's like, I don't know, he's like the first half of this book he is. with Jin. Yeah. And, like, just seeing – I really enjoyed the stuff that he would do. Mm-hmm. Like – I like that I, she, like, getting in a fight, and he's like, all right, let's go outside. Yeah, <laughs> you know? like, I like that in the way he looks at Jin. Also, there's, like, the, the moment where, like, Jin couldn't kill a guy who was, like, about to board, like, their ship. 
Yeah. Remember that? Like, he, mm-hmm. she she the was Imperial. like, stay back, stay back. And they thought he had a gun, and then someone else shot. She was 14. But then Saul comes in, and he just looks at her and he's like, good job, just like I taught you, you know? Like, yeah. he doesn't think about, like, what it did to her yeah. or any of that kind of stuff. And I, it's... Because he doesn't... It's not the to make soldier, a good father, you know? does Saul Guerrero yeah. make. Yeah. It was just moments like that where, like, yeah. I was kind of thinking, like, man. And I... It, I it also helped me understand Jen more, but it also helps me understand Saul more. 100%. And I just, I like just little moments like the that that happen. carnage and chaos, like, what is, like, I, <laughs> whenever we uh, hear from Mom Mothma, it's like, well, we don't only really fuck around with Saul Guerrero. Yeah. Because of his military. He's an extremist. He's an extremist. Whatever, you know, and like, I, in my head, I'm going like, well, man, you know, you guys will end up blowing up the Death Star, you know? <laughs> like, there might have been a good d- dude or two on that thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, when you see what Saul is capable of doing, like ripping open a a room full of Imperials, dignitaries, and civilians, well, they refer to it as the massacre. It's right? the massacre, like, and they're right. He, it's a terrorist attack. It is, and he is so like so. Like it makes when you watch like <laughs> rebels and uh, even Bad Batch some uh-huh. right, like the the targets they pick, and honestly, I guess Tarkin right. It's like mm-hmm. ah, what's well, won't make for a good example. We yeah. need something to be, you know, mm-hmm. important. Like Saw is just one of those people where it's like anything that he can do that will hurt the Empire, yeah. it doesn't matter who or what's in the way, yeah. he will do it. Whereas like the rebels are like, we'll attack military mm-hmm. targets. We'll hit satellites and depots, but we're not hitting a place where there's just yeah. people in it, you know? But Saw won't care. It's uh it's lines like and I not <laughs> I know not everybody loves this, but it's lines like Rose Tico in The Last Jedi saying it's not about fighting what we hate, it's about saving what we love. It's lines like that that ring way true when you see Jen experience what she's part of and what Saw is. Yeah. Like well, she loves him and wants to, him to wants to be with her, but I'm reading that and being like you need to get away from this guy. Yeah. You know? Well, and then, like, she sees that. And, like, you were talking about how Jen, uh, you know, she doesn't have a favor. She doesn't favor the Rebellion or the Empire. She doesn't like either one because yeah. of the destruction they mm-hmm. have. So she sees that, and, like, here are the, the partisans, the rebels, right? Yeah. But then she sees the Empire just blasting a planet. That's the thing, You yeah. know? And it's like both of them are just, like, they don't care who's here or what they're doing. Yeah. Not everyone uh... here is evil, but they're making sure they get the task they want done done. Yeah. No, the uh, mm-hmm. Lieutenant Colonel Sinjax is the Imperial broadcast guy, mm-hmm. and he's the like you know he's the propaganda machine, and he gets that giant scar on his face like he was in there too. Like whenever the the Star Destroyer or you know, bombards it, it's he, the, yeah the rebels, it's the people. Imperials are still there. They haven't worked on Protocol Thirteen where hey everybody everyone get out, get off the planet. We're gonna blow it up, you know. <laughs> uh, and then the next time you see him, he's like, yes, the uh, you know, rebel terrorists were responsible. It's like, dude, you were there. You saw you it. You know what happened. You also kind of seemed like a, like maybe a more decent dude. Like he was like, don't be rude to protocol droids. And usually when I see that, I'm like, hey, he has empathy, <laughs> you know, even to, to something that maybe doesn't quote unquote deserve it. Sure. So I thought that was a really well, interesting thing. It, it reminds me of Karn a little bit from, from Andor where it's like, well, he had a sense of justice. Sure. That's a good point. Cause even yeah. like, uh, Obi-Wan, whenever like R2 is missing, he's like, ah, just get another one, you know? Yeah. And that's Obi-Wan who like, people are like, that's a good guy. Yeah. So you have an Imperial being like, ah, be nice to protocol yeah. droids. But like, that's the, not typical. But the next time you see him, he's, he's excusing another massacre. Right. Yeah. So it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. The hooks got into him and the weight was down on him too. He has this like cybernetic guy. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, that was, um, yeah, that was Tamsy Prime. Though. Tamsy Prime, mm-hmm. yeah. That's one thing. Like, I did get lost on, like, I'd be like, okay, we got, we got like, school or we something. school. Right? There which was, is like, spelled S-K-U-H-L. Okay. And then we had, like, Insunagi or Insu... Uh, Inusagi. Inusagi. Uh, Saul's base is on <clears throat> W-R-E-A, like, Ray? Ra- Ray? I don't know. Hmm. There's... I oh. try. I tried. I wanted. I don't know if there's any pictures of these, but yeah. there was a species in this book too. The wraith, ray, ray. I don't know. They're the ones. They had one like trapped, and they talked about how they were like swimming or moving so majestically. But then they had one also like being tortured. Yeah. When they were trying to figure out like mm-hmm. Saw's location or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I didn't find and, anything in terms of what. Yeah, they I really like. wanted to see what they looked like because they sounded like Jen described them as being like like these just beautiful creatures. But then seeing this other one and like being like terrified for it and this i don't know it was interesting you asked me earlier today like hey there's one thing that i saw i don't know if you saw 
Oh, you and I, I'm very curious what it is. What it was? Yeah. Um, because I have one too, and I was like, I, I wonder if Aaron thought of this. Um, the one that I saw, or that I, I guess I heard. Yeah. Um, was about a rodent. A rodent. Did you yeah. catch that too? What's his name? Well, there was a rodent <laughs> called a a bulba. It's called a bulba, and I I don't <laughs> so, know. So well, yeah, it's whenever uh, Jin and uh, I think Hatter uh, Hatter they're like on kind of like a date ish yeah. thing. Yeah, and they were talking about like all oh, their everywhere. Like, I haven't seen them. Like wait, I was like, what was this called? But they yeah. talked about a rodent uh-huh. that like has a thing with vines. Yeah, it's a symbiotic relationship or something, right? right? Like Obi Wan Episode One talks about the Naboo and the and the Gungans and how they are part of a symbiote circle. They mm-hmm. support each other. This rodent like actually gathers this vine and intermingles itself and strengthens itself and it has this vine like attached to its spine and and it's called a bulba. And yeah. I just immediately was like Aaron's gonna think this is a bulbasaur. As I was thinking of <laughs> there's, like, a there's, Pokemon like a, in here. there's like a Pokemon inside this thing. I was like, what is this bulba thing? Yeah. It was like the same thing happened whenever they talked about um oh shoot, Professor Who Whoen or whatever. Professor Who who was like he arrived thousands of years ago in a yeah. blue box. And yeah. I was like blue box yeah. like it was one of those kind of moments like are they talking about doctor who here <laughs> like this is another one that's like is this is this a pokemon <laughs> as as they were talking about it like you know it was like oh my god it's a grass type <laughs> you know yeah i wasn't and sure I, if you would think about it being that it wasn't not, but... until it said rodent that i was like it ruined my illusion because like as they were talking about this thing i just it came more and more I'm like it's a bulbasaur <laughs> it would have been great if it was just a bulbasaur yeah. like, roaming around yeah but yeah it was <laughs> called bulba i was like that's cool yeah so. so i uh i definitely saw that and thought of you so you you incepted into my reading ah, uh, yes. time. Um, there was uh, another really cool little, you know, we can talk about some of the things that we saw or we heard uh, in this book. There's a character named Zosad. He's a Twi'lek, and he's like a, uh, I don't know, like a recruiter for the Rebellion. Mm-hmm. Jen, who's kind of already jaded about the Rebellion, ends up <laughs> like gra- like flicking his Liku and stuff. Yeah, you know, this but, is the one that was trying to recruit Hatter, right? Yeah, but he he has a line where he like pointedly says like, hey, do you know about the fulcrum? Mm-hmm. And she has like she says like he said it like that should mean something. What is yeah. this fucking thing? You know, I'm going holy crap. What does that mean? What do you think that he was? Was he like my, searching out fulcrum, or was he trying to see if she knew more than uh, my thought? Because that used to be a saw guy, right? Yeah. Um, my thought was that maybe he's still with the rebels, but maybe he's more with like Ahsoka and mm. Bail Organa, and yeah. maybe more on that side of the rebellion, Mon okay. Mothma and stuff, and dealing with Fulcrum, maybe. And maybe that was them trying to give a mm-hmm. clue of like, does she, who is she? Because I think in that same moment, he, he and she both assumed the other was like who they were working for, or what they were yeah. doing, and where they were. So he didn't know if she was with Saw or not. Okay, and she didn't know if he was with Saw or not. Yeah. And then when he said that, that was him trying to be like, are you part of this yeah. too? And since it didn't click. Jen had no idea what it was, yeah. but I was like, "Oh, that's cool." There's, no, it that, must be a tie to the fulcrum was, idea. Of- that was just a fun like wink to the audience that our main character doesn't understand. Yeah. But if you know, you know. It was really yeah. cool. I like that. That's how I took that one too. I thought it was a fun tie into some rebel stuff. Sure. And even still, uh, isn't that the m- that's the name they used at the end of Clone Wars, referring to Saul Guerrero, right? Yes. Uh, so. Saul is a fulcrum agent, or at least uses the fulcrum frequencies. There's a couple different people that could. <laughs> possibly fall into the fulcrum thing like i don't know if we'll get into that in andor or or not um yeah, I don't know. but certainly it would be cool uh, to see the origin of fulcrum like where yeah. it officially starts but that's got to be remember that must old... be in the clone war somewhere yeah i think was she 16 at that time um it was between like the 16 and 18 it was year. with hatter i think that would have been 16 okay because i was trying to think too like well callus is a fulcrum at one point as well mm-hmm. but that's a little later in the war yeah or it I should say, be. closer to a new hope. Closer towards, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also really like <clears throat> that Saul Guerrero uses battle uh, damage droids as target practice mm-hmm. because Jen will later in Rogue One refer to K two S O as target practice. <laughs> so, so that's a yeah. cool little detail. Well, she referred to a was it in the, it was in this right where she referred to a yeah. droid like that thing's not worth anything. Might as well use it yeah. as target practice. Everyone's like, "Jeez, yeah. what did exactly. you say?" <laughs> yeah. You know. So so I just thought it was fun <clears throat> that oh they're giving like a story to that one line, which is half of the old eu yeah <laughs> sure you know so I, I um like we also had a uh a mention uh, i don't remember what her name was i didn't write it down i didn't look it up afterwards but um it was a daughter i believe of lux bonteri did fuck i missed that did you not catch that no i they, didn't catch it they mentioned when i don't it was what either was I doing? it was like a daughter or something of they said about lux and they mentioned about saw and different things and it was someone that was working with saw early on in the book 
but I don't know what her name was. But I'm pretty sure Next there was a mention. Lux's goddaughter. Goddaughter. There you go. So there was Lux's goddaughter involved. So they who? mentioned Lux Bonteri, and I don't remember okay. what her name was. Who was that? Who's the goddaughter? I don't, I don't remember. I don't know what her name was. Next, Nexus. You have to tell. Damn it! I'm reading books now. Mm. I'm, I'm not listening. Maya. Maya. <laughs> if I saw Maya? that, I'd be like, ah! <laughs> Maya. Okay. Yeah, but it was early on. Part um, of the partisans. Interesting. It was early well, on with Saul Guerrero. I mean, Lux. We know will eventually go and like you know he went to the Mandalorian, so he might go. To some bad people for some stuff, maybe. But like there was the connections of Lux and Saw and yeah. Steela and all them there and oh, yeah. stuff. Oh but yeah, definitely. When they said about like daughter, but goddaughter, I guess gives mm-hmm. more. I don't know possibilities, you sure. know, of what that could mean. But uh, yeah. But I just thought that was interesting. No, I, I, I did that. realize Lux is in that arc uh, with Ahsoka on Andoran. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andoran, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So that was interesting. I think that was all before the. Uh, that was before the traitor stuff and mm-hmm. the and someone else shooting the one yeah. dude and saw being like good job so, but yeah, <laughs> yeah I thought that was really cool just to have that and I don't know I don't know if there's more of that that we'll get into with mm-hmm. other books and stuff but I was like oh Lux ah that gotcha honestly that was we talked about one point of like getting into the book and I feel like lots of times the books are like okay well, when does this book like hook me you know yeah. and uh, I don't know if it hooked me hooked me but that happened I was like and I, I feel like I perked up more I'm like. Where are we going more with gotcha. this? I want to. I want to hear more about this. So, yeah. but I don't know. How do you? How much do you find that your mood that you're in? Because we are, we're. You know, I probably wouldn't be reading at the pace I am if I wasn't preparing for Badonka Gong. Sure. Right? Yeah. So, how much do you feel like your mood or your mind state can affect you in in, in this like new way of absorbing media for you? Hmm. I don't know. The the, the big thing, and it, it's weird because with books, it's different. It's like being distracted easily sometimes. Yeah. Like I, when I'm reading a book, I'll often have a when I'm going through and I'm like, "Fuck, what I just read?" And I go back and I gotta reread it again. Yeah, like sure. That. But with listening, it just keeps going. Sometimes like, yeah. what happened there? What the fuck? Should I well, rewind it? Okay, wait. No, I, I caught up. I know what's going yeah. on now. I mean, it's but as still far real, as yeah, it's as still far real, as, like it, mood itself, though, I don't, mm, I don't know if that, okay. I don't know if that necessarily affects me. Okay. I try to do that. Lately, what I've been doing, and I feel like it helps me retain, is like. I try to just find a place to sit and chill and listen mm. versus trying to do other tasks sometimes. Okay. Cause when I'm doing other tasks, I find myself like my mind starts to wander and then yeah. I'm like, shoot, get back to this. And I don't, I don't want to get distracted so much. I'm actually going to try a new method for the next book. A new and, method. And I'll let you know how that works for me. Okay. Where like right now it's more so like, Oh, I got time. Let me, let me listen to how much time I have for right mm-hmm. now. Um, I'm going to switch to trying to do like X amount of chapters each day. And like every day, just have a little bit that I do. Have a more like <clears throat> planned agenda. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna do that, and then like I, I wanna, certainly I want fall to do... into the trap of like, oh, I got time, and then like, oh, I got three days. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> I got uh, five hours left. My goal time. is to be like, all right, let's do two chapters today. Like, I yeah. don't know. It depends how many chapters are in the book, I guess. Sure. But I just do two chapters today and take some notes of that, and then let that yeah. sit me for sit with me for the day, and then the next day I'll do like another two chapters. Gotcha. And I'm gonna try that and see how that works for it. But I get you. Like anytime I starting something new, like doing this with the uh the audio version um anytime you do something new like that's a new quote-unquote muscle yeah you've never used before so it gets better as you do it like i certainly felt that way when i used to read versus when i started rereading Mm -hmm. now i'm like oh man i've atrophied that muscle i'm not as good at reading i have to go back okay what (laughs) you go back and but when I was reading all the time, I could just absorb, absorb, absorb. You know, I think that's yeah. what has happened. Like with we do reactions and television, you just get better, right? If someone sat down at our table to do a reaction and has never done it before, they might be overwhelmed by the the speed at which we move, right? Sure. In terms of our thought process and stuff like that. So I, I definitely have felt that with this, but I will say, it's uh, Obi loves that I'm doing this now because when I'm like, all right, I have like. An hour or two this morning. I want to get this done. I'm just going to take Obi to the dog park. Ah, just let him run around and, and stuff. I, well, he no, he doesn't want to run around. He <laughs> wants his ring. I have this like blue and orange ring, and I have this little throwing stick with it. And this dog will not stop. Like he'll kill himself before he stops chasing the ring. Right. So if I have an hour, I'll just go out there and I, I, it's all I do. I'm listening to the book. I'm super into it. We're in like the shy dog section because mm-hmm. he doesn't do well with other dogs yet where i'm trying to just kind of like have him around other dogs before he actually interacts with them sure because he's very small and a lot of those dogs are very big and I, he doesn't understand that really so literally i will listen to 12 chapters 
and all I do is sit there and throw a ring. <laughs> and Obi comes back to it, and I just like go into this meditative stance. Like I, I, I just want to do that. And I think that he's going to be like, yes, let's read more. More reading. I want my ring. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. As long yeah. as you have like something like that. Where yeah, that's in. been good. And then obviously, you know, when you do like work around the house or something like that. But I find that I end up being like, wait, what did I say? I mean, 30 seconds back. I don't know where I am. Sure. Yeah, yeah that happens. Mm-hmm. It's tougher with like kids. Sure. Yeah. Like they want to talk. You. Oh, I'm sure. I don't need to hear the barking, yeah. you know? But like yeah. when they were like, dad, throw it again. And, uh, what? Yeah. And also just because I only have one ear available to me, like I often pause. Like even if I see someone like from far away, look at me. I have no idea if they're going, hey, or something like that. You know, like, your dog is getting away or something like that. So <laughs> even when there's people close to me, I find myself pausing a lot more than I maybe sure. should, I guess. I don't know. I, like, I can't really, like, interact with the real world when I'm in the zone like that. So. I understand. Well, was there anything else that you wanted to go over in terms of uh, Rebel Rising? I mean, um, I mean, we didn't have to touch on anything too specific, I suppose. But yeah. one thing I really liked that was, like, a theme that kind of kept coming back was the uh, – there's a quote by – who was the first person that said it? I want to say maybe it was Hatter's sister, right? What was her Ooh, name? Oh, yeah. I, I, uh, I... Tanith. Was that what it was? Tanith, who died of a terminal illness called bloodburn. Oh, the bloodburn thing. Yeah. yeah. Bloodburn is. That's interesting, too. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a sickness that young, specifically younger pilots get it more commonly. But when you're in space, there's just something about being in space that gives you this, like, it, it can give you this fever. And uh, she gets it. It's called blood burn. Mm-hmm. And no one knows why it happens. But there's, like, you know, you could try to, you know, diet and exercise. But really, there's this one medicine that will help you with blood burn. Unfortunately, it's also extremely addictive. And you can die. <laughs> and she did. Yeah. And I I really like how uh, the mother, uh, Akshaya, yeah, Akshaya, Akshaya she right, talks, yeah. she won't let Hatter pilot. Like, there's no proof that it's hereditary. But Hatter's young. And it's like a, it's almost like an excuse of like, I'm not letting you go fly because you can yeah. get blood burned. But that's why he wants to join the rebellion too. It is. it is. And then it feeds into a whole thing and that's why they get caught really. And like, and Jen has that thing of like, she didn't really want him to go do that, mm-hmm. you know, but he, and then he falls in love hard. Oh yeah. Hard. Well, and well he, I mean, Felicity Jones. She's a, yeah. Right. Beautiful woman. And he, it reflects on, he knows what she used to do, or at least has some ideas of what she used to do. Then he starts thinking about that too. So he wants yeah. to go. Some guys recruiting at the bar mm-hmm. or whatever. They go down there. That guy's a loud mouth who's getting caught and seen by everybody. Yeah. I was like, Jesus. And then he just starts shouting. And, and Jin, like, shuts him up. But it's too late it's by too then, late. you know? know. So it, They come and kick in the door later. I, I really hate the terrible, like, just turn of events, how everything happens just to cause all this, all these problems. And, yeah. And, like, she has that feeling of, like, if I let him go, if he didn't, if I wasn't here, he might have gone and joined and he wouldn't have been in that ship. Yeah. He wouldn't have been in Ponta 1 or whatever it was. Yeah. But yeah. but with all that too, I really mm. like the quote. Um, they they had a quote that was, uh, "We are ants and they are mm. giants." Mm-hmm. And there was just there's something about that theme that kind of kept coming back yeah. that I just really enjoyed it. Like the idea of like, well, if you just you know if you don't look up, you know if you keep your head down, if you ignore yeah. it, we're ants. They don't care about us unless you cause a big enough ruckus, mm-hmm. and then they start stomping. You know, and that's yeah. kind of how they describe it too. Of like, once the ants started to do too much, then the foot starts stomping yeah. of the giant, and but. It was another one where it was like, if they bend over, the ants can get them or, or something, too. And so, like, there was just an interesting theme within that. And I started trying to think about that more with, yeah. like, Rogue One sure. or different elements of, like, well, all the ants are getting together and they're mm-hmm. going to take down the giant and stuff. And yeah. I thought that was an interesting, like, analogy that they had. Yeah. There's also this uh, really interesting theme of, like, the frontier uh, in terms of the outer rim. Like, there's this moment where Akshaya takes them outside and look at the stars. Like, the Empire just can't be everywhere. Mm-hmm. There's too much. Yeah. But the book really makes, you know, with the, uh, you know, like, Jen's constantly trying to run away and get to somewhere safe. And then, like, the five points, right? That space mm-hmm. station. Like, the Empire will eventually go everywhere. Like, that's how big and scary they are. Like, yeah. there is no running. There is only stand and fight. So I thought that was cool too. Um, did you have anything else for the book? Um, not specifically. I will Those say are some of the bigger things I caught and yeah. whatnot. And, uh, I, I did think it was interesting that uh, we do get to see the the beginning of Rogue One, right? When yeah. she's brought to Yavin Four, yeah. um, and Mon Mothma is introduced to her. I like that Jen, who's this young girl throughout most of this book, and 
uh, unfortunately has the the troubles of being a woman in the galaxy as well as a rebel slash uh, someone that is being trodden on. But she sees this this woman, this strong woman that is like, oh no, there's someone, there's a fighter. Look at her. And uh, Mon Mothma is like I thought it was interesting. Jen knows who she is. Like, yeah. does the galaxy? Like, no Mon Mothma? Because she was introduced as exiled senator. senator. yeah. And I didn't really think about, like, I always thought Mon Mothma was still just secretly, like, Bale's kind of secretly doing stuff, right? I thought she was secretly doing well, stuff. But it feels like she was, like, out and about. At with it. that point, it would have been after Rebels, right? Whenever yeah, she was, like, so. she was, like, escaping. Because that's she had the during speech. Rogue One. Yeah, so you're right. I think there, like, the senators and stuff, she might be one of the forefront senators. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. All of our senators, yeah, necessarily not for every state, but I know a few of them for a few states just because they're either really big jerks or really cool. Yeah, people they're or, either awesome you know, or they're terrible. Yeah, they're either really cool or really terrible. You don't know the satisfactory ones. Yeah. <laughs> so you have Mon Mothma, who's really pushing like for an equality kind of state, and yeah. the empire's overreaching all this stuff. And then eventually, yeah. when she leaves and does that speech, just news yeah. gets okay. out. So she's probably fairly prominent in that. So gotcha. Yeah, I think it's all. And then I just I love the way this book ends because the entire book Jin. She misses her father. She is ashamed of her father in a way because she thinks that he is, you know, he's just, he he drunk the Kool-Aid and left her and went and doesn't really care about it. And, you know, she discovers that's incorrect in Rogue One. Yeah. But in, so the book can't go too far into it, no. how she will eventually feel. But you end the book with this conversation between Galen Erso and Lyra Erso talking about kyber crystals and jen has that kyber crystal the whole time which i did discover there was a continuity break in this book before the rogue one novelization states that jen had the kyber uh pendant smuggled into the labor camp whereas in this it explained that they kind of just thought it was a yeah. broken piece of glass some stormtrooper right? was like whatever yeah, just, just keep this you know but i'm like when yeah. they said i'm like glass Me in the too. prison yeah. wouldn't you not want them to have that yeah apparently there's some like continuity break and then that's going to happen whenever you have new media it's not everything's going to be perfect because guess what the shit's fake um but they have the conversation about the kyber crystal and he says kyber is much more than a rock mm-hmm. it has the potential to change the whole galaxy uh, and Lyra points out, like, it's cracked, it's broken. Yeah. And it ends with, you never know, something strong and broken really can be powerful. And he's talking about his daughter. I know. I when, when when they said that, I'm like, oh, like Jen. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was really cool, no, too. No, I, I got really emotional uh, because, like, and I want to rewatch Rogue One because I, yeah. need, I need, like, that's, that's what, what I'm saying. This that's what he wanted to say. Oh. Whenever he couldn't say it, yeah. right? Oh, so good. I feel like this adds so much more to different things. Like, yeah. there's that thing where it's like, what's his line that Galen says where it's like, everything I do, I do for you. I there's do for there's you. something like yeah. that, right? And then she goes through most of this book yeah. believing her father abandoned. Yeah. He joined the Empire. He's against everything that him and his friends were for. Mm-hmm. And then you get to the end of that and he's, you know, dying and everything. Yeah. And it's like, I was never for it. There is a, I lied. There mm-hmm. is a, there's a way to destroy this thing. And I yeah. was doing this all for you guys to stop this great. You know, that motherfucker you know? like painted like a big middle <laughs> finger, like behind that right? exhaust. Yeah. 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 He <gasps> was so, but I just, yeah, every time I watch Rogue One, I get so sad that fucking Galen Urso doesn't get to say anything real of substance. But in reading this book, I kind of feel like I, like even just that last chapter, you that, get that last feeling. part, I yeah. feel like, oh, I think that's what he wanted to say. And I, it was really special. Yeah. So. No, I like that a lot. I thought, there's some really good things in this book. And if you like Jyn Erso and yeah. you like Rogue One and you want to really understand yeah. that more, I think this book did a really good job of all that. Aaron, there will be a Badonka Gonk where I don't cry. Will there? But it is not this day. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Rebel well, Rising. Well.